I want to take a moment and thank Dr. Ernie Moniz uh, for coming, and, coming here and talking to us about the importance of carbon capture and the role of technology. Uh, next, I am here joined by an amazing panel um, that's here to talk a bit about what their companies are doing or what the departments are doing as far as decarbonization is concerned. And also tell us a bit about um, you know, some of the insights, especially from the people who are at the sharp end of the problem of deploying CCUS. Today, I'm joined by uh, the panelists and I'm just going to introduce them right now. Um, Margaret, do you want to start first? Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Anirudh. My name's Margaret Mystery. I work in Equinor. It's an international energy company with headquarters in uh, Norway. And I work as a manager in our future business uh, unit. Um, future business was set up to look for new growth legs for Equinor outside of our, our legacy core business. Uh, and I'm focusing especially on carbon offsetting, carbon removals, reductions and offsets, and looking for opportunities there. Very interesting area. Anna? Hi everyone, very happy to be here with you today. Uh, I'm Anna Laurent from Veolia. Um, so Veolia is a company that does uh, waste, water and energy, environmental solutions uh, across the globe. And I'm the strategy manager for UK and Ireland. So my work spans across all our operations in the UK and in Ireland, uh, working on what the future of the business will be. And there is a a big aspect of it, which is decarbonizing our activities. Um, so I'm very happy to be uh, here today. Thank you. Alex? Yes, and thank you very much for having me. Alex Millward, I'm from the Department of Bayes, Business Energy uh, Industrial Strategies, and I'm the Director for Carbon Capture, Utilisation and Storage. We're together working with a number of colleagues where they're laying the foundations for the government's 10-point plan for carbon capture, utilisation and storage to enable the capture of industrial emissions and prevent them from going into the atmosphere, as well as uh, blue hydrogen, as well as adding to our energy security through uh, gas-fired power stations with carbon capture. So we like the energy that hydrocarbons bring and we just want to get rid of some of the waste product and put them safely and permanently away and delighted to be here. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think that actually brings me uh, very, very nicely to a question for Equinor. So, Margaret, Equinor has an ambition to achieve net zero. Uh, could you talk a bit about the strategies you are deploying to achieve net zero and some of the examples of how this is happening? Sure. So there's three main levers we have for reaching net zero. The first is efficient oil and gas operations, so reducing the carbon footprint of our oil and gas production. And there we've got an ambition to be carbon neutral by 2030. Electrification is a really important tool um, to get there. And we've just announced recently initiatives on our Sleipner and Troll fields. So that's a project example there. Um, the second lever is renewables and low carbon solutions. So our oil and gas production is going to be declining after 2030. And then we'll see investment really shifting towards renewables. So we expect to... Uh, spend about 50% of our capex on renewables and low carbon solutions after 2030. And in addition to a growing offshore wind business, it's growing ever bigger, um, we focus really on very large low carbon solutions projects in major industrial clusters. Uh, so for example, in the northeast of England, we've got three uh, projects currently where we're doing gas, gas to power with CCS. And that brings me to the third lever, which is CCS and especially storage. So we've got ambitions to grow from five to 10 million tonnes of uh, CO2 stored annually uh, in 2030 to 15 to 30 million tonnes stored annually in 2035. And our flagship project there is Northern Lights, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, it's a partnership with Total and Shell. Um, and that is the world's first third party CO2 storage and we're storing safely 3,000 metres below the seabed uh, CO2 for our customers. Um, and we're really hoping that that will bring us uh, to our first 5 million tonnes of storage when, when we get to phase two. Oh, wow. Um, and I do want to ask, I mean, Vio is a company that's known for circular economy 
um, and uh, I know you value that quite a lot. Um, I would want to understand the, the strategies or the goal around decarbonization of EFW plants. Um, and if, uh, if there are any examples you want to maybe talk about that. Sure. Um, so, yes, when you look at Veolia, we've been, you know, pioneering circular economy for decades already, trying to close the loop as much as we can, recycling two million tons of material every year just here in the UK. So it's really at the heart of what we do. But obviously, when you look at our portfolio of activities, um, energy from waste is a big part of our current uh, carbon footprint. And it's been really valuable to divest lots of waste from landfill, avoiding emissions from uh, landfill. But we need to uh, obviously deal with the emissions from, from the sector. Um, our primary um, you know, way to decarbonize it is to increase recycling. So this is really what we've been focusing on, increasing recycling infrastructure, uh, working with DEFRA and the rest of the government on the resource and waste um, strategy. But when you look at the residual uh, emissions and the actual footprint of a site, there is uh, definitely a need to capture uh, carbon. So this is why we've partnered with you uh, on the uh, trial uh, for uh, this technology at our facility in Sheffield, which is you know, great to learn and, and you know, uh, together uh, explore this uh, more. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, recovering um, ex extra materials after the combustion process. So it's really no silver bullet. Uh, it's really looking at all the options for us. Exactly. And I think that's a, that's a great point, that there is no silver bullet. We need to be coming and coming up with all options and deploying all the options. Um, I do want to sort of move to Alex now and, and try and maybe focus a bit about the industrial decarbonization and the place of heavy industrial decarbonization. Uh, within the government strategy, wider government uh, outlook. If you could maybe talk about that. Yeah, I think when government committed to net zero, uh, it recognised a number of strategies. First of all, don't emit if you don't have to. Secondly, if you do have to, do it as efficiently as possible. And thirdly, if there are some of the so-called hard-to-abate sectors, then the balance between that life-enhancing quality of being in work, providing services which are essential for our economy that uh, you know, we all live and breathe uh, and benefit from daily, then let's use technology uh, to be able to remove the parts that we don't want uh, through carbon removal and permanent and safe storage away. And that's largely in that sort of heavy industry, as you say. You know, there are a lot of um, newsworthy items at the moment around that industry uh, for lots of different reasons, but uh, you know, there's lots of things which we all benefit from, steel, cement, uh, energy. Uh, waste removal, um, concrete and, and other, other sort of industries where a large number of people are employed today um, and we can use you know, technology and innovation. The science and innovation that does exist in the UK can continue to thrive and, and help us achieve net zero in the, in the short time that we have to do it. Yeah, and I, I can certainly uh, ascertain the fact that we've been beneficiaries of the government's long-term strategy. Uh, you know, the current technology that we're deploying is actually funded by the government's grant, um, and that has allowed us to achieve uh, a massive reduction in this size, um, and hence the cost of carbon capture as well. Um, so, you know, coming back to the residual emissions, I think um, it's quite important to realize that there will be value of offsets as well. Uh, Margaret, I mean, uh, what are the big changes you are seeing um, as far as um, carbon capture in, as an industry is concerned? Yeah, so in the market, um, it's, it's really, I think the urgency that Alex just mentioned is really being reflected in the market and we're seeing prices increasing. Uh, so uh, the EU ETS has been trading over 50 euros per tonne uh, lately. Um, but in addition to that, uh, individual countries have been increasing carbon taxes. And uh, you mentioned offsets, the voluntary carbon market is also really growing. I think last month or even this month, uh, Bloomberg reported that 274 million tonnes of credits had been traded. And that's more than the annual emissions of Spain. So that market is really starting to to heat up and that's driving investment into um, BECs, negative emissions, all of these solutions which we, we need. Um, so we see, you know, with all these trends coming together and I, I want to mention as well the increased collaboration in the space. There's a lot of partnerships, capacity expansion happening. All of these trends together I think are going to mean that 
carbon capture and storage is going to get competitive and uh, costs will come down, uh, we think around 2030 it will become viable uh, as an alternative. It's a very, very interesting point, especially around the, uh, the offsets. Um, I mean, I, I want to come to uh, Anna from here because, you know, energy from waste industry has a massive potential to um, offer negative carbon emissions as well. I think you touched upon that, but it'll be interesting to learn a bit more about the challenges you face um, in terms of decarbonizing spe specific sites. Yeah, I think when you look at the, the overall sector in the UK, there are about you know, 50 facilities. Um, the Oliac portfolio, we have 10 of those facilities, um, which are actually all uh, so-called dispersed sites, which means that they are kind of far away from the clusters where CCUS is looking to be developed first, and they are kind of very limited access to other options to transport the CO2, either via shipping or, or road and rail, because we're close to where the waste is you know, emitted. So whether it's central London, in the middle of Birmingham, Sheffield, etc., it was built to minimize logistics around waste transportation. So this is a challenge in itself when you look at the portfolio. Um, I think looking at how the overall sector can be decarbonized is um, a really uh, important thing to look at, but we should not use a kind of blanket approach on, on how this is going to be done because you will have different speeds and, and uh, varied ways to do that. When looking at the biogenic um, aspects of the carbon emissions, currently because we have about 60% of the waste that is uh, going into residual waste and then treated in energy from waste, this is coming from organic uh, waste and then 40%, which is about fossil, so all your plastics and so on. Um, so there is a big opportunity to, one, reduce that fossil aspect through increased recycling, which is really what we're working towards. And then obviously, if you put capture on top of that, then you have this ability to generate negative emissions from that biogenic content of the waste, which is very interesting in terms of offsetting and um, helping the overall country to achieve net zero. Exactly. Um, I mean, I, I, I cannot emphasize enough how difficult it would be to reduce or remove the emissions, especially residual emissions from the heavy industry. Um, Alex, um, from your, you know, you're, you're at the heart of the action. So from your day-to-day -day, uh, interactions with the industry, are you picking up the same messages as well? Uh, that there's not enough space, maybe it's too expensive? I think it's very consistent, actually. Margaret talked about the partnerships. I think the public and private partnership has been very strong and has advanced us further before. There has been a couple of times in the UK where we've had a full storm on carbon capture because the costs were high and there wasn't enough support for the benefits at uh, that time. I think the global, national, local conversation is very different. Um, but I think it's fair to say not everybody is convinced of this technology. Uh, or the cost of this technology. So we do need to tread very carefully in that partnership. And I think that's happening really, really well. Um, and I think part of that and the cost that you mentioned is why uh, the starting premise is in these sort of closely concentrated clusters, uh, whereby we need to look after for sure the, the shareholder of the private sector and the stakeholders and employees there, as well as uh, the taxpayer, all of us, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and for the price of this. So we need to sort of start with something which is you know, the lowest cost possible to start with until Margaret sort of points out that cost reduction kicks in. Um, and so that's why they'll be in those close concentrations where a, a, a pipeline can be used to connect a facility to a store. And then uh, what we're calling non-pipeline transport, which may be shipping, maybe rail, maybe road you know, to be decided and, de and designed. Uh, you know, uh, the Northern Lights is using shipping, um, which I think will advance the, the world's knowledge, which would be fantastic. Um, and then we need to sort of get into some more inland solutions as well. Uh, and, you know, how that will work, don't know. And then you know, we're working very closely on that economics to get that balance between the private sector stakeholders and the public sector stakeholders, uh, whereby Currently, under the capital system, industry is not as incentivized, particularly in a global landscape, uh, to initiate this without support. So that's why the government wants to get involved to offer the initial support, 
and then you know, certainly all of the private sector have said they, they, don't, they want the government to sort of step back and get into a regulated involved. And you know, no one wants sort of continual subsidy. It's to get it launched and then uh, sort of step into regulation rather than you know, ongoing subsidy support. Yep. No, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, the, 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 the investment from the government would be actually to just get the technology deployment going. And once we are above that, you know, the first over hurdle, then after that, it should probably be hopefully free, free, free flowing from there. Um, and, and I think UK is a great place. I mean, look at what has happened with wind energy. Just the deployment has gone uh, really in, in multitude of directions. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, we are quite passionate about, and that's what this whole research started of compressing the science by 10 times, is to solve the supply chain problem. You know, if you're thinking about deploying the technology 500 times at a scale where it is today, how do you actually source, how do you manufacture, how do you produce? and how do you deliver in a fully skid-mounted modular fashion? So, um, Margaret, I mean, um, when it comes to dispersed site, you've already talked about the uh, transportation, but uh, do you see uh, a role for um, modular skid-mounted equipment uh, for dispersed sites to reduce the cost in the future? Yeah, I think that's going to be crucial. I mean, I talked about this enormous storage potential that we see on the Nor Norwegian continental shelf and in the North Sea area, you know, up to 30 million tonnes of storage we've got to fill. Um, but to fill that, we're not only going to be looking for large sources of CO2, we're going to need to aggregate together lots of smaller sources. Um, now, to make that viable for the, the smaller emitter or customer, um, they're going to need small scale equipment and they're also going to need lower costs. So getting down the cost and the size is going to be really important to, you know, really stimulate this industry uh, moving forward and, and fill up the storage. Yeah. Um, I think, Anna, again, the same question. Um, do you think the industry might benefit from standard scalable modular solutions? Um, that you can deploy whenever you want? Yeah, I think when we started to look at the portfolio of our sites uh, within Veolia, you know, the first question, and it's a showstopper, is do we actually have space on site to capture the carbon? Even before looking at, you know, where it's going to go, uh, long-term storage or, you know, utilising in some way or form is actually do we have enough space on site because most of our sites are you know really optimized in terms of the layout and it's really tight so um, when you look at the traditional solutions to capture the carbon it's almost as big as the energy from waste plant itself which obviously is not working for us so having that reduced footprint is absolutely critical and makes it viable for much more sites and then you can go the step after which is, you know, how, you know, once we've captured the carbon, what do we do? Um, and it's also important to look at maybe ideally you want to capture everything, but actually there might be space to just capture a proportion of it, depending on what space you have on site and the other, you know, uh, solutions that you put in place on that site. So it's really, you know, that modularity that is going to be really, really helpful to, to deploy it at, at scale. Yeah. And I think uh, if we start to sort of deploy this in the UK, I think that it would certainly be a role for the UK as a, as a country to start exporting this knowledge outside of the UK. So, Alex, do you see there would there could potentially be a role? And if yes, then what would that role be? Yeah, for sure. Actually, first, sort of come back on a couple of points here. I agree entirely, actually, with Margaret and Anna in that. And in addition, uh, I'm relatively new into public sector, so I'm learning an awful, awful lot of other things. And the other advantage of miniaturisation then comes to local acceptance. Um, whereby, you know, the, and, and with our sort of devolved decision making that happens in this country, you know, local buy in to the choice is very helpful. So, you know, a doubling the size of a plant due to, to capture tends to increase resistance. Uh, so, miniaturization and you know, the things that you know, humankind has achieved since we've been around with the innovation and miniaturization and cost driving down is really important. So that, that, that sort of planning permission will be really important. And of course, we sort of talk about safety as well. You know, safety would also be another uh, element. Um, I think the way sort of UK government works, you talked about standards, and I think what my experience is, everyone loves a standard as long as it's my own standard. <laughs> um, so there will be continued innovation from competition. Uh, and, and I think that will sort of make us all better and safer and help drive the costs down as well. Um, and as part of the 10-point plan that I mentioned, you know, we do estimate there'll be up to 50,000 new jobs created you know, from the UK 
uh, you know, good quality jobs, um, partly as some industries transition uh, and to enable a fair transition from one industry, you know, oil and gas, which Margaret talked about might be you know, you're reducing into a growing one um, that can do that. And you know, I would be incredibly proud if we could all then enable that capability, that knowledge, then help the whole world decarbonise. Um, because you know, it's no good just UK being at net zero. We need the whole world at net zero. Uh, Mother Nature's not giving us any time extensions. Uh, so we, yeah, I, you know, that would be amazing if we could get that all working. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> exactly. Mother Nature is definitely not giving us time. Uh, we are less than three days away from COP. So I would take this opportunity and ask a question. If you had one wish and a magic wand, what would that be? You mentioned COPs. So now I want to talk about Article 6, which is a really <laughs> boring wish, but I want them to sort that out at COP. Um, I mean, yeah, just just forward momentum and 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 not wasting time on on disagreements and and, uh, and arguments. That's what I'm really hoping for from this COP. Yeah, I think for me, it's really um, building on the Paris Agreement, actually having the right policies in place to deliver it and not fall short, but go beyond and have that trajectory to keep with the 1.5 uh, trajectory and have it, you know, the world net zero by um, 2050 would be amazing. Alex? Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Um, I think the one addition I'd add is I'm a believer in the net zero um, and you know, that net does require a bit of pragmatism and that may have to allow certain countries a pragmatic route through it, which isn't necessarily sort of consistent with some of the messages I'm hearing through. So I think some pragmatism and compromise uh, to, to sort of focus on the goal of keeping us within touching distance of the one and a half degrees is, is the most important and get that commitment to make it happen. Absolutely. Well, we'll all be watching what happens at COP negotiations. I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. Thank you so much. And I want to now hand it over to our Chief Technology Officer, Pratik, to introduce the technology in a lot more detail.